Good morning, Peace Haven. Would you stand to your feet, please? So good to see you today. Uh, I just want to say this. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. And I have something to read here. I want to make sure I get this right because we're trying something different. You know, we always try to have a special gift for mothers or for fathers on Mother's and Father's Day. And so today, we are trying something a little different, guys. I hope this works out because it's supposed to be really, really good. But we are offering today Frio's Gourmet Pops today. Now, you may not know what that is, but they're frozen pops. And I don't know exactly what that means, but what we've heard is that they're really, really good. Now, we got six flavors. we got caramel sea salt, chocolate, strawberry, birthday cake, orange cream, and raspberry lemonade. If you can't find something there you like, there's something wrong with you, all right? And so today, right after the service, right back here in our area, we have an area set up. You have pictures made today uh, with your family, with your children today, and you can pick those up today. So we're keeping them cool back there. I believe they're on dry ice, and so... Uh, just go back there and make sure you get you one, all right? We're looking forward to that. Let's turn our attention now to our prayer focus. We want to first of all look at our Deacon of the Month. Our Deacon of the Month this month is uh, Steve Wiles, and of course Steve and Debbie. Debbie's our office manager, and I just want to say this. She don't want me to say it. I don't think she'll mind too badly. But Debbie does a fantastic job uh, managing our office, and I don't know what I would do without her. She is just a such a, yes. She is such a blessing, and so I just want to say, you know, she's a blessing. I don't really like Steve, but I really do love Debbie. No, no, I love Steve. Steve does a great job playing our guitar, and he's just got a great servant's heart, and he's a Tar Heel fan. That doesn't hurt, and so we're so grateful for them. We'll be praying, of course, for them. Our, our prayer focus of the week is Frank Nixon, and Frank is, where is Frank at? Frank, where are you at? You're somewhere. He, oh, he's backslidden. He used to sit down here, and, and then he's moved to the back. But uh, Frank's had some health problems, so we want to be in prayer for Frank. Frank's joining the church today. Y'all may not know this. He's been visiting for 100 years, and he said, I want to join the church. You know, he's never joined the church. This morning, during our invitation, Frank will be coming forward. He'll be joining our church. I'm sure he'll get the vote. What do you think? I think he's going to be all right. And so, Frank, we sure love you and appreciate you so much. And, of course, our missionary is Adam and Angel Ragsdale in Thailand. And let's continue to pray for them. Let's pray for our service today. Let's ask God to be with us. But, fathers, I want to say this to you today. I know your job is tough. I know it's hard. And I know that at times uh, you just feel like, Lord, what am I going to do? And it's at that time you just need to say, Lord, what are you going to do? <laughs> you know, you got to turn it over to the Lord sometimes. You just got to say, Lord, I'm doing my part. I'm counting on you to do yours. And if you'll train up a child in the way that he or she should go uh, when they're old, listen, that, that training is not going to leave them. It's not going to depart from them. No matter what direction they take, they will always remember what you taught them. And so continue to teach them the truth of the Word of God. Thank you so much, uh, fathers, for following after our Heavenly Father, who loves us unconditionally, tells us the truth all the time, tells it in love, sometimes harshly, but He tells us the truth all the time. And so we're grateful most of all today on this Father's Day for our Heavenly Father. If you agree with that, say amen. amen. And with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you so much today that we get to celebrate Father's Day. Lord, I thank you for the fathers and the grandfathers, the great-grandfathers, maybe even the great-great-grandfathers that are in this room today. God, for those listening live stream, Lord, we're so grateful for them. God, I just pray that today that you would meet with us. Lord, uh, we realize we're here today to worship. We're here today to exalt the name of Jesus. So, Lord, as we lift up your name, I pray that today, Lord, that you would draw all men to yourself. Lord, draw some of us, Lord, maybe that have just kind of slipped away. Lord, draw us closer to you. But most of all, Lord, draw that person that's never known you, Lord, to a saving knowledge of you. Lord, again, meet with our service, inhabit the praises of your people. Be with our worship team, our band. Be with Brother Chuck today as he leads us, Lord. Be with our choir. Uh, God, I thank you, Lord, for everybody that's serving today. Lord, it's a blessing just to know. Lord, they love you enough to serve you. Lord, we love you today. We ask it, of course, always in the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
Come on down. While they're coming down, and Steve's coming to uh, give us our scripture reading for today, I want to do this. Um, if you're a father today, uh, or have you, if you have played the part of a father, you know, it might be that biologically uh, you've never fathered children, uh, but you've mentored children, and you have been a father to some children in some way, shape, or form. Would you stand, please, real quickly? You'll just stand to your feet. All of our fathers in the room today, if you would just stand and just remain standing for a moment. And I just want you to look around. These are men we need to be praying for, lifting up in prayer. And I want to do this right now. Uh, uh, from personal experience, your job is tough. 
and I know that, but we want to give you a hand today and just thank you so much for your diligence. And at this time, would everyone stand together for the reading of God's Word? We're in Revelation 5 today. Brother Steve. Good morning. Revelation chapter 5. I'd also like to give a shout out today to a very special guy, Mr. Perry Dickerson. Y'all please keep Perry in your prayers. And I saw in his right hand of him that sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. He prevailed to open the scroll and to loose the seven seals. And I looked and behold in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures. And in the midst of the elders stood the lamb as though he had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out from heaven and then he came and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne now when he had taken the scroll the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb each having a harp a golden bowl full of incense which are the prayers of the saints and they sang a new song saying you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us by God with your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of the mighty angels among, around the throne of the living creature and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain yes. to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which was in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever yes then the four living creatures said amen and the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever amen amen Please, Please, Please.
Amen. Let's do a little bit more of that. Count us in, Paul. Sing that chorus, Glory.
Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Wow, what a great song. What a great truth. Man, it's already been good to be in the house of the Lord today. I'm so grateful today for y'all being here. I'm going to try to move this by myself. We'll see what happens. All right. Those, those curls have been paying off. All right. My back's out, but my arms feel good. All right. If you will turn in your Bible today to Ruth chapter 4. Ruth chapter 4. Those of you visiting with us today, thank you so much for being here. Dale, it's good to have you and your family with us today. It's been a long time and we're so grateful for y'all. Thank y'all for being here today and others that we're seeing today. Thank you for being here. Again, if you're visiting with us today, right after the service, you'll go back to our welcome area. We have a special gift for you back there. And of course, fathers, as we have already mentioned, uh, we have a special gift for you today. By the way, if you're visiting today, uh, Please take advantage of those Father's Day gifts as well. Sometimes you come into a church and you think, well, I'm not a member, so this is not for me. This is for every father that's in here today, every grandfather, every person that's, every man, that, male that's played a key role in uh, the raising of a child and the mentoring of a child. Well, I tell you what, you know, our theme today, as you have already seen, has been somewhat uh, uh, centered around the word worthy. Today we're going to talk about a worthy redeemer. Again, our theme today, even in our scripture reading from Brother Steve today, and in, even in our song selections, is the term worthy. And so I want to, you know, we say often, we oftentimes say uh, that he is worthy, or somebody is worthy. What does that even mean? Let me give you a definition here of what worthy means. Worthy simply means this. It means that you possess the qualities that merit recognition in a specified way. Let me say it again. Possessing the qualities that merit recognition in a specified way. As Brother Steve while ago was reading Revelation 5, we read of Jesus and Jesus alone being worthy to open the seven sealed scroll, which in e essence is actually the title deed to this earth more or less. And as we read, he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Our Bible says he's the root of David. And our Bible even says in Revelation chapter 5 that he is the lamb that was slain. And if you go to Revelation chapter 13 and you get to verse 8, you will read that it's the lamb, he is the lamb that was slain even before the foundation of the earth. In every way possible, Jesus possesses the qualities that merit him and him alone the recognition of one to be worshipped by all. Every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In other words, let me just say this, Jesus is worthy. Hey, repeat this after me. Jesus is worthy. Hey, today we cannot say it enough. So today what we're going to do is we're, con we're going to connect the word worthy along with this definition and along with the person, of course, of Jesus Christ. And we're going to connect the term worthy as an adjective to the noun that tells the story of our deliverance from the slavery of sin. That term is, of course, Redeemer. Our title today is Worthy Redeemer. As you can imagine, a redeemer is one who redeems. That's quite obvious. I don't want to overstate the obvious on that. And by definition, though, redemption is this. Redemption is the regaining possession of something lost or sold in exchange for full payment of the debt. Now keep in mind, what is worthy? Worthy has to do, go back to worthy, and let's read that definition one more time. It's someone who possesses the qualities that merit recognition in a specified way. So there's our adjective. Now let's go over to redemption. What is redemption? It's, the re it's regaining possession of something lost or sold in exchange for full payment of the debt. And so we're talking about somebody that possesses the qualities that they can be recognized in a specified way. And what we're going to do today is we're going to connect that to a person, a redeemer. In other words, a person who regains possession of something lost or something sold in exchange for full payment of that debt. So in essence, a worthy redeemer is one who possesses the qualities. Again, to be recognized as one who can regain possession of lost souls by paying the full sin debt. That's a worthy redeemer. And I shouldn't say a worthy redeemer because that's the indefinite article. Let me give you the definite article. That's the worthy redeemer because there is no other. Now, in light of that biblical truth, Jesus alone was worthy in his sinless state, to offer himself as the sacrificial payment of our sin debt in full, that he himself might regain possession of me and possession of you in our lost condition. So Jesus, as our worthy Redeemer, through the payment of his own blood, through the payment of his own death, bought us back 
We were lost, sold into sin, slavery. And he bought us back out of that slavery. And in other words, here's what I can tell you today. I can speak for myself. Hopefully you can say the same thing. I am redeemed. I am redeemed. I am a product of Jesus' redemption. Right now, I stand before you, bought back out of, the, out of sin slavery and placed my, with my feet on a rock, that rock which is Jesus, and I have been declared righteous before God. Somebody say amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Look what our Bible says. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you, whom you have from God? And watch this. You are not your own. Here it is. For you were bought with a price. You were bought at a price. What was that price? That was the price of Jesus' blood. That's the price of Jesus' death. That's the price of Jesus' sacrifice. Ladies and gentlemen, today, I am not my own. I've been bought with a price. Therefore, what am I supposed to do? Paul says, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. That's possessive. God owns me. God bought me back, bought me back because of his sacrifice through his son, Jesus Christ. And so today, let's pay close attention to that truth. And while we're paying close attention to that, let's pay close attention here in Ruth. You're going to see the prefiguring of our worthy Redeemer in the person of Boaz. Now, of course, Boaz is a human being. He is a person. However, throughout the Old Testament, there are prefigurings of Jesus Christ. Boaz is one of those as we see him as the worthy Redeemer. When we left our story last week, Ruth had proposed marriage to Boaz at midnight. But you remember, Boaz has a problem to address. The problem is this, there is a person of closer relation. As we have read in in, uh, Ruth chapter 3, we have seen in Ruth chapter 2, we have seen that Boaz is a very close relative, but he's not the closest relative because our Bible tells us there's somebody that's closer. And so as Ruth comes to Boaz at midnight, and as she proposes marriage more or less in essence to him, he says, I want to do this, however, there is a brother of closer relation of closer kin, he has to get first option. Remember, the persons of the closest relation must have first choice, and apparently Boaz is second in line. Now, you remember mother-in-law to be, Naomi, she is in hopes that Boaz will be the man that's going to redeem the family property and perpetuate the family bloodline. You remember, she needs this. Here's why. She marries Elimelech. They have Malon and Chilion, but then they leave Bethlehem at the beginning of this story, and they go down to Moab, and they're down there, at least she's down there for 10 years, and during that time period, Elimelech, her husband, dies, and then her her two sons die, and so here we have Naomi with no means by which to redeem the family property as they come back to Bethlehem, and no way for Elimelech and Malon's bloodline for their lineage to be carried on. And so Naomi is just hoping so much that Boaz will be this particular individual that will, uh, again, redeem the family property and, of course, perpetuate the family bloodline. By the way, nobody in this story wants this any more than Ruth except for maybe Boaz. I believe Boaz really wants this to happen. Ruth wants this to happen. Naomi wants this to happen. But you remember what Naomi, Naomi told Ruth? Ruth has proposed to Boaz. Boaz has told her to stay the night. Nothing sordid going on for her protection, protection of her body, protection of her name. He sends her off early in the morning to go back to Naomi and tells her, I will go and I will address this with the closer kinsmen. Ruth comes home to Naomi. Naomi says, where have you been? What's been going on? Tell me the whole story. And she tells her what had happened. And this is what Naomi says. Those words we don't want to hear. You remember? Sit still. Stand still. Be still. Sit still, stand still, be still. That's the hardest, those are the hardest things to do, ladies and gentlemen, when you're waiting on God, is to sit still and wait. Stand still and wait. Be still, listen, and wait. And so that's what Naomi has told Ruth to do. Now you've got to remember this. You've got to remember this. Naomi and Ruth, they have no money to speak of. They can't redeem the property. They can pay no taxes, really, or debt. So they are right now 100% dependent on the worthiness of another for redemption. And can I just make a parenthetical statement here? We are 100% dependent on Jesus and Jesus alone. Our redemption is 100% contingent upon him. If he doesn't die, if he's not buried, and if he doesn't raise again, and if he doesn't choose to redeem us, ladies and gentlemen, we have no hope. 
And so we put ourselves in Naomi's place. We put ourselves in Ruth's place realizing we need a redeemer. I may be talking to somebody in this audience today or somebody listening live stream and you think to yourself, well, I'm partially responsible. No, you're not. He's completely responsible. You say, well, if I do enough good things, if I do enough good works, then uh, perhaps he would allow me to be righteous. No, our righteousness comes through Jesus and Jesus alone. He became sin who knew no sin that I might become the righteousness of God. When he died on the cross, he put sin to death. In putting sin to death, he made God's righteousness available to me that, God, that Jesus' blood can cover every sin that I've ever committed, every sin I ever will commit, just my sin nature, just the fact that I owe that debt, a debt I could not ever pay, and yet he paid it for six hours on the cross. That's the only hope that I have. So I am today 100% dependent on him keeping his promise to me that he's declared me righteous and that he's holding my salvation and that no man can pluck it out of Jesus' hand. Jesus is in God's hand and I'm safe and secure there. Are you safe today? Are you secure today? If you are, it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with him. And so today we see Boaz prefiguring Jesus. In that, Naomi and Ruth are 100% dependent upon a worthy redeemer. There has to be one. They can't afford to maintain the property. They need money just to live. So for the sake of Old Testament information, I'm going to quickly give you three types of Jewish redemption specified in the law of Moses. Here they are. There are certain redemptions here. Number one, redemption from slavery. I'm not going to take time to read these passages, but if you will, if you'll make a note just to read Leviticus 25 and Deuteronomy 25 and to kind of get an idea. But number one, there is a redemption in the Old, Old Testament Jewish economy. If a man in economic desperation, he sells himself into slavery, and that happened commonly. Commonly. Now, the Bible does not endorse. You know, you hear all the time people say, well, the Bible didn't even get slavery right. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Wilberforce and Lincoln both used the Bible to, uh, to enforce abolition. And so do not think for a minute that the Bible didn't get slavery right. The Bible addresses slavery because it's a reality. The Bible does not endorse slavery. Never has. God does not endorse slavery. Men are born free. Doesn't matter what color their skin is or where they're from. And so today, don't think for a minute that, that God is endorsing slavery or ever did endorse slavery throughout the Old Testament or throughout the New Testament. Never did. However, it was a reality. Sometimes a man would owe a debt and he more or less would sell himself into slavery that the debt might be paid. But if a man in economic desperation sells himself into slavery, his brother can buy him out according to Leviticus chapter 27, 25 verses 47 through 48. Then there's also a redemption from poverty. From poverty. If a man sells uh, his property in economic desperation, his brother can buy it back. Now, of course, as we talked about from Leviticus 25 as well, back in verses 8 through 13, I believe, there is the year of Jubilee, where every 50 years, interestingly enough, every 50 years, all property went back to the original owner. But in the, uh, the interim time, though, property was bought, property was sold, and of course, during that interim time, if a man wanted his property back, his brother could redeem that property or buy it back. So number one, in slavery, they could be redeemed. The brother could buy him out of slavery. Number two, poverty. You can buy him out of poverty. Number three, though, and this is very interesting, Deuteronomy 25, there's redemption from the grave. And you say, what in the world is redemption from the grave? Well, it's exactly what we're talking about. Elimelech is dead. Malon is dead. Chilion is dead. Specifically, Elimelech and Malon, because Malon is Ruth's uh, uh, dead, uh, deceased husband. And so they're dead. So if they're going to be redeemed, if their name is going to be redeemed, if their bloodline is going to be perpetuated, somebody's got to do that because they're already in the grave. So a man's name can be perpetuated by a near kinsman who marries, this is how it works, he has to marry the widow of the deceased and then they produce a son with her. Now in our story, Elimelech again is dead and Ruth's husband Malon is dead. That's Elimelech's son. He's also dead. Chilion is dead. There are no sons to carry on the family name. So Boaz, as a near kinsman, wishes to fulfill the role of kinsman redeemer. But is he truly qualified? That's the question. That's what we have to answer today. Is he qualified? Let's look at three things here. Number one, is he worthy? Number two, is he, of course, wealthy? Number three, is he willing? Let's talk about Boaz for a second. We're not going to take time to go back and read these verses, but you will see in these verses and in our study that we have learned, number one, Boaz is worthy. What makes him worthy? According to the Old Testament law, Boaz is worthy because he's a near kinsman. 
Now, of course, it starts with the brother, and then it works its way out. If the brother refuses or if he's not able to, then it just keeps fanning out until it comes to a man of a a near uh, kinship who is able to redeem the property. So number one, is he worthy? Well, we know he's worthy because he is a near kinsman. We read that in verse 1, 3, and 20 in chapter 2. He's a near kinsman. We understand he's worthy. Number two, is he wealthy? Chapter 2, verse 1 indicates that he's a wealthy businessman. He's a wealthy landowner. So he is wealthy. Number three, is he willing? And listen, when you read chapter 3 and you read verses 10 and 11, you can kind of feel the excitement in Boaz that Ruth, a young, beautiful woman, has uh, taken interest in him and actually proposed to him, hey, let's get married. And Boaz, hey, he's, he's the first one on the bus ready to ride. However, there's a near kinsman. So we understand he's worthy. He's a near kinsman. Number two, he's wealthy. He has the means to redeem the property. Number three, is he willing? You better believe he's willing. (laughs) If you hadn't picked up on that, you ain't been paying attention. So, let's read verses one and two of chapter four. Here's where we are. Boaz, he's left Ruth. Ruth has gone home to Naomi. Boaz is going to approach the nearer kinsman to see what his intentions are. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, a close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, come aside, friend, sit down here. So he came aside and he sat down, verse 2, and he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here, so they sat down. As Boaz promised Ruth, and you remember what Naomi said to Ruth back in chapter 3? She said, Boaz won't rest until he takes care of this. And that was true. Boaz made, I mean, he's making a beeline for the gate. That's where they held their court proceedings. And the elders would come together. So Boaz does this. Boaz meets with the unnamed relative. We're never told his name. Furthermore, he sets up a court proceeding among the elders. There's 10 elders here at the gate of the city to ensure the the legal legitimacy of this ruling. Boaz assembles the elders, he summons the closer kinsmen to the gate, and then Boaz presents his case. Here he is in verse 3, listen. Then Boaz said to the close relative, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. See, it's our, she's already had to sell it just to survive. And I thought to inform you, saying, buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. In other words, Boaz says, I'm second in line. And here's the crusher. The nearer kinsman, the unnamed relative, says, I will redeem it. Boaz here, he speaks of real estate in the presentation of his case. Uh, but I'm, I'm almost positive, I believe I can say this, uh, Boaz is not really concerned with real estate. I think Boaz, is, he already has real estate. I think Boaz is more concerned with Ruth. Ruth is his primary concern. And Boaz comes into this thing, and you know he has to be praying all the way. He's a man of prayer, and he's already, you know, demonstrated his godliness. So Boaz it comes to the gate so hoping that this unnamed relative will display absolutely no interest whatsoever in redeeming this property. But to his complete dismay, to his complete chagrin, the man says... I will agree to redeem the real estate, and you have to kind of picture Boaz there, his heart just drops into his stomach. I mean, you can just see the lump in, or or, or, or just feel the lump in his throat as he proceeds on, because Boaz was so hoping, the man says, I have no interest. I don't care anything about this. Boaz, you go on. I don't don't care a thing about this. And Boaz is listening, and he's praying, and he thinks maybe, you know, God, are you listening? God, are you listening? That's not what I wanted to hear. Lord, I thought you were working here, and now it looks like you're not. Ladies and gentlemen, just because there's a setback doesn't mean that God's not working. Just because you take a step backwards in life every once in a while doesn't mean that God has forgotten you. Boaz, in this situation, I'm sure, I'm sure he's very disheartened. I'm sure he's very disappointed, but he's a man of character. See, the key with Boaz is this. Boaz is not going to manipulate, and he's not going to get ahead of God. He's definitely not going to step out of bounds. Boaz wants this thing done right, and I just want to remind everybody in here, no matter what you're waiting for, do it the right way. Keep it right. You say, well, Pastor John, I've just been praying about this for so long, and I want it so badly. Well, that's okay. However, 
do not get in God's way and do not get ahead of God. Because God has to give it to you for it to be right. And if you take it, instead of being gifted by God, you're in for a heap of trouble. There are consequences. There will be repercussions. And you will look back and say, I wish I had waited on God. You remember our statement around here? You can quote it as good as I can. The only thing worse than waiting on God is wishing you had. Can I say this? It's better to want what you don't have than end up having what you don't want. Let me say it again. It's better to want what you don't have than end up having what you don't want. That's why we wait on God. That's why we, we stay patient before God. Because God knows what you don't know. God knows what we don't know, and God knows what He's prepared for you and what He hasn't prepared for you. And so today, it has to be that you wait. So here's Boaz, and Boaz is trusting God because he thinks in his heart, Ruth is who he wants. He thinks in his heart, Ruth, God has brought Ruth to him. And he doesn't understand, probably in this moment, it's so disheartening as he shows up, but he does not in any way try to throw this man or try in any way to manipulate this man. So we get to verse 5. Boaz, then Boaz said, On the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth, the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. The question in verse 5 is not, are you worthy? Because the nearer kinsman, he's worthy. And it's not, are you wealthy? Because it's obvious, he is both of those things. He's worthy, he's the nearest kinsman. He's, he's wealthy because he has apparently the money to do this, to redeem this property. The question is, are you willing? Will you marry Ruth the Moabitess? And so Boaz says to the man, on the day that you do this, you've got to do this too. Verse 6. And the close relative says, I cannot redeem it for myself. And Boaz says, "Woo! he's fist pumping already. I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm anything, one man took off his sandal, he gave it to the other, and this was confirmed in Israel. Right there, this was a confirmation in Israel. Therefore, the close relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, so he took off his sandal. Apparently, marrying Ruth was the deal breaker. Oh, he was very optimistic about redeeming the land, but marrying Ruth, well, that's just too much sacrifice. The man understood from the law that to marry Ruth was actually to obligate the firstborn son to carry the names of Elimelech and Malon, and, and perhaps we don't really we don't understand the man's family dynamic because we're not told a whole lot about it. But there was something within that. He says it's going to ruin my inheritance or might mess up uh, my inheritance. And perhaps, you know, he feared the risk of a son, not of his own name, and ended up inheriting his land and possessions, and of all things, the son of a Moabitess named Ruth. Not everybody in Judah was excited about Ruth being there. Not everybody looked at Ruth through the same lens that Boaz looked at Ruth. God had given Ruth special favor in Boaz's eyes because he was not, Ruth was considered to be unclean. Ruth was considered to be a heathen. Only God could work this out. And so God had put it in Boaz's heart that Ruth was who he was supposed to marry. And so Boaz is pursuing this. However, there were other people that looked at Ruth through judgmental eyes and said, I'm not going to have anything to do with a Moabitess. And I'm sure not going to take a chance that I have a son with the Moabitess that's going to carry on a family name of Elimelech and possibly mess up my inheritance. I'm not doing that. It might have been if somehow this man's sons died off prematurely and we don't even know if he had sons or what was going on at this time in his life. But uh, so many things could have happened in the mix. So we don't know, again, enough about this man's family dynamic to understand exactly what he feared in marrying. Here's what we do know. There was something there that caused pause. There was something there that created some conflict and some friction in, all, in the man's heart and in his mind. And he says, you know what? This could interfere. This could short circuit what I have planned for my inheritance. And so I'm not going to do that. He understood the ramifications of doing that. We know this, though. 
We know that Boaz, we know that Ruth, and we know that Naomi are waiting on God. And ladies and gentlemen, here's the blessing of it. God is at work. Your situation right now, God has it under control. He has it under control. And as bleak as things may look at times, you've got to remember, wait, always wait on God. I was reading just a couple of days ago. It's a book by John L. Mason. It's called An Enemy Called Average. And he tells the story of these giant bamboo stalks in Asia. Let me read a little bit about it to you here. He says, during the first four years, I thought this is so interesting. He says, during the first four years, they water and fertilize these bamboo plants. The plant was seemingly little, no result. Think about that. For four years, they're watering, they're fertilizing, and, and, and basically no result. And so he goes on to say, then the fifth year, they again apply water and fertilizer. And in, watch this. And in five weeks' time, the tree has grown 90 feet in height. You know, I was thinking about this. I believe that if something grows that quickly, you can almost sit and watch it grow, don't you think? I mean, think about that for a second. During the first four years, they water, they fertilize, the plant with seemingly little to no result. Then the fifth year, they again apply water and fertilizer. And in five weeks' time, the, the tree has grown 90 feet in height. He goes on to say this. He says, the obvious question is, did the Chinese bamboo tree grow 90 feet in five weeks, or did it grow 90 feet in five years? The answer is, it grew 90 feet in five years. Because if at any time during those five years the people had stopped watering and fertilizing the tree, it would have died. Now, the results were obvious during those five weeks. The results were obvious as that tree is growing those 90 feet. 90 feet's a long, hey, that's, a, that's a lot of growing, right? I mean, you know, we talk about watching the grass grow. That probably doesn't work out. I believe you could sit there and in an hour's time see this thing grow. I mean, it's growing. But he, here's the point. The point is that sometimes it looks like that nothing is happening. As we're doing the right thing and as we're following God, as we're, as we're fertilizing and as we're watering our situation, you know, with prayer and with faithfulness to God, we look and we think, wow, nothing is happening. And then all of a sudden, have you noticed this? God shows up and suddenly everything's happening. And then we say, well, did that just happen in those five weeks? Or did that happen over five years? And I say to you, it was happening all the time. As you were being faithful, as you were watering, as you were fertilizing, you were setting the tone and you were preparing the, the earth for what God wanted to grow out of you. And all of a sudden, he shows up. All of a sudden, there he is. All of a sudden, what you've been preparing for and waiting for, it happens. And so, ladies and gentlemen, today, realize this. Right now, it may look like that nothing's going on. Keep watering. It may look like that no results are going to happen. You keep fertilizing. Keep honoring God keep being faithful to God keep doing the right thing and then all of a sudden what will happen is boom there it is there it is here's Boaz Boaz says to the man deal or no deal and the man says no deal God's work is being done but then something strange happens something very strange happens here and, and, and it's at least the semblance of Deuteronomy 25, uh, 7 through 10. And we'll look at that in just a second. But the man took off his shoe and he handed it to Boaz. And technically, as we read here, and as we'll see in Deuteronomy 25 in just a second, this procedure was a bit more harsh and embarrassing than what happens here. Let's read Deuteronomy 25 real quick. And I want you to see what's supposed to happen. If a man does not want to take his brother's wife, now think about this, okay? Uh, in this situation... The man can just refuse, and, this, and that's basically what he does, because he's, he's able to do this. He can do this. He can marry Ruth. He can redeem the property, and, but he has the option to refuse, but watch what happens if he does. If the man does not want to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate to the elders, which is where Boaz is, 
and say, my husband's brother refuses to raise up a name, uh, a name to his brother in Israel, he will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Watch this. Then the elders of the city shall call him and speak to him, but if he stands firm and says, I will not take her as my wife, watch what happens. Then his brother's wife shall come to him in the presence of the elders, remove his sandal from his foot, and spit in his face, and answer and say, so shall it be done to the man who will not build up his brother's house. In other words, this, it, this is terrible. And his name shall be called in Israel, the house of him who has a sandal removed. <laughs> you know, and that's a stigma. That was a stigma in Old Testament. If you were the house of the man who had your sandal removed, what that means is you would not do what you were supposed to do with your brother's wife. Your brother passed away. And there's his widow. She's got nothing. And you leave her with nothing. And so, in essence, we read that. Um, you know, and here, here's what we understand. We understand this. The man, more or less, just saves Ruth the trouble. He just takes his own sandal off and says, here's my sandal, you know. Uh, saves himself all this public embarrassment from being denounced by Ruth and ha have her to come and spit in his face. And, and you say, why didn't Boaz make her do that? Listen, he's too busy fist pumping. He doesn't care anything about that. He just wants to get all the technicalities out of the way. He wants to get back and he wants to give Ruth and Naomi the good news. Look at verses 9 and 10. Our Bible says this. In verse 9, And Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and Malon's from the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth, the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his position at the gate. You are witnesses this day. Case closed. Before these witnesses, the case was heard, and now it's history. It's in the books. Boaz more or less proclaims, let it be known that the debt is paid in full. Let it be known that the marriage can now take place and be completed. And, and when I was reading this a couple of days ago, I, I, I couldn't help of, uh, but, but to think about Jesus. Because this, this, this story so beautifully just points to Jesus. As Boaz is here, he is proclaiming, the property was bought, the debt is paid, the marriage can happen. How about Jesus on the cross? Jesus says, to tell us die. It is finished. You know what he's saying? He's saying, now I can buy back every soul that believes in me from the slavery of sin. Now I can marry my bride spotless because she is declared righteous before God. The property can be retrieved and redeemed. The marriage can take place. By the way, if you're part of the bride of Christ today, say amen. You've been declared righteous, spotless before God, spotless forever. Case closed. I want you to notice three things in these verses, verses 11 and 12 as we read this, because I think it's important. Verses 11 and 12 says this, All the people who were at the gate and the elders said, This is their response. Their response to Boaz is this, we are witnesses. Now, here's what they ask. This is kind of like the toast, so to speak. The Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah. In other words, make Ruth like Rachel and Leah. Remember Rachel and Leah were Jacob's wives. The two who built the house of Israel. And may you prosper in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez or Pharez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. First of all, and we're going to talk about this a little more next week, so I don't want to steal any of my steam. I'll just say this. They said, may Ruth be fruitful like Rachel and Leah. Now you remember Rachel and Leah were responsible for eight of the twelve sons of Israel. And we'll talk about that again next week. But the, the, the blessing is this. The hope is this. The hope is that Ruth will be fruitful just like Rachel and Leah perpetuating the house of Israel. Number two, though, in verse 11, the Bible also tells us this. It says, may you be famous. Read it again. And all the people who are at the gate and the elders says, we are witnesses. The Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah and the two, the two who built the house of Israel. And may you prosper in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Well, ladies and gentlemen, do y'all know who the great-grandson, we'll talk about this in a couple of weeks, the great-grandson of Boaz and Ruth is a man named David. How many of y'all know who David is? Just raise your hand if you know who David is. Is David famous? 
Is he famous? You better believe it. Sometimes infamous, but he was definitely famous. But even more so than that, probably the most famous person that has ever lived was on down the line. His name is Jesus. Whether you like him or not, you know who he is. Whether you believe on him or not, you know who he is. Jesus was famous. David was born in Bethlehem and grew up in Bethlehem. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And he is the most famous descendant of all. But then I like this part, forgiven. Forgiven. Read verse 12 with me again. You may not know this story. May your house be like the house of Perez or Pharez, whom Tamar bore of, to Judah because of the offspring which the Lord would give you from this young woman. You know, uh, as you go back, and I, I'm not going to tell the whole story, but e even the law of the Redeemer and the brother not willing, uh, you know, to take his wife, this, Judah, of course, predates the, the Old Testament Mosaic law. But there was still a tradition where a brother would marry um, his brother's widow if they passed away and that happened twice and Judah's family had a son that died and was married to Tamar and so Tamar was supposed to be married to the next son well the next son uh, you know he refused he refused to to do that part and so uh, he dies and then uh, Judah has another son and Judah promises Tamar okay well when he's of age you know you can marry him well when he became of age uh, Judah broke his word so Tamar does something that's just horrible in desperation, Tamar dresses up like a prostitute to where she is unrecognizable. And she tempts Judah, who doesn't recognize her as his daughter-in-law because she's all garbed up with all this, this, uh, you know, this attire. And Judah ignorantly sleeps with Tamar his daughter-in-law. And you say, why is Tamar doing this? Well, because her husband dies, which is Judah's son, and she's supposed to have a child with the next brother. He refuses, he dies, and then when the third brother is of age, Judah refuses to let this happen. So Tamar's thinking, if I'm ever going to have a son in this family, it's Judah. And she fools him. And he fathers a child with his daughter-in-law not even knowing it. You might want to go back and read the story because how it all comes out and how it's revealed is very interesting. But from that act comes a boy named Perez or Perez, which, by the way, if you trace Jesus back, Jesus comes out of that lineage as well. Hey, can God take a mess and make something good out of it? Thank God for his grace. And here's the point. God forgave Tamar. God places Perez in his lineage as an ancestor. So God in his forgiveness and his grace uses a horrible situation to bring about something that's good. And so the people are saying, may you be fruitful like Rachel and Leah. May you be famous, and they were. Uh, by the way, speaking of famous, there are two people, or two names, that are on the pillars of Solomon's original temple. Do you know what they are? Second Chronicles 3.17, read it with me. Solomon set up the pillars before the temple, one on the right hand and the other on the left. He called the name of the one on the right hand, Jacob, and the name of the one on the left, Boaz. How's that for famous? Got his name on the pillar of the temple. God is just so good in such bad situations. By the way, what does Jacob mean? Jacob means this, he establishes. What does Boaz mean? Boaz means strength. What great appropriate, I mean, how appropriate for the t temple pillars to bear those names. But let's close this where we're, every sermon ought to close. What about Jesus? What about Jesus? Number one, as our worthy Redeemer, let's talk about three things. Number one, is he worthy? Is he worthy? 
Well, he's worthy because he's God. And he's worthy because God made himself our kinsman. When God became flesh in the person of Jesus, he became our kinsman because he is akin to us in that he understands every temptation that we've ever gone through. He understands what it's even like to live and to exist in a human body. But his worthiness, ladies and gentlemen, you can attribute that just simply to the fact he is God. Number two, is he wealthy? Well, let's talk about his wealth. Does he own the cattle on a thousand hills? Does he own everything? Here's the thing, though. That does not matter at all when it comes to the wealth that is necessary to save us. Every once in a while, you know, you hear somebody talk about, oh, he's, he's wealthy. Well, he created it all. Jesus' wealth does not rest in the cattle on a thousand hills. Jesus' wealth does not rest in everything that is on this planet. Because I want to remind you of something. Everything on this planet is worthless other than people and souls. So how do we know if he's wealthy? He has to possess something that is necessary to buy us back. And he does. It's righteousness. His wealth rests in his righteousness. Because in order for him to qualify and to be worthy, in other, in other words, in order for him to possess the qualities that we talked about earlier, that deemed him specialized recognition, that is the righteousness of God. If, if Jesus is not righteous, his sacrifice is not complete. If Jesus is not righteous, his sacrifice is obsolete. Because it had to be a perfect, spotless lamb. And so when we talk about, his, is he worthy? Yeah, he's worthy. He's God. But is he wealthy? He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. So what? You can sacrifice them all. It doesn't pay for one sin. What was necessary? His wealth rests completely in the fact that he is the righteousness of God because he is God. And what he did, he took our sin, he gave us his righteousness. Now here's the big question. If he's worthy, that's one thing. Is he wealthy? That's another thing. How about this? Is he willing is he willing? Philippians chapter 2. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. He became our kinsman. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. What that means is that means he's willing. He's willing. No man took his life he gave his life. Isaiah 53 verse 10 says this. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. And so today when we talk about Jesus being our kinsman redeemer, our worthy redeemer, is he worthy? You better believe it. Is he wealthy? He's the righteousness of God. And it took that perfect sacrifice to pay for every sin. Our sin debt. Is he willing? He's already proven that. Hey, what more does he have to do to prove that he's willing? It's not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. His will is for you to be saved. And he was willing to go to the cross that that might happen. And, and so today, I say this to you. You have a worthy Redeemer. I have a worthy Redeemer. My sin debt... I have been redeemed. I've been bought back. The debt has been paid in full. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm part of the bride. And as, as excited as Boaz was about marrying Ruth, 
can I say that pales in comparison to the excitement that Jesus has every time a believer trusts him as Savior. Amen? <laughs> Jesus is excited about it. And I may be talking to somebody today and you would say, Pastor John, I'm not part of the bride. When Jesus comes back to claim his bride, I'm not part of it. Can I say this to you today? He wants to save you. He wants to redeem you. And he's already paid the price. All you got to do is say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I am in debt. In a debt that is greater than I could ever repay. And Lord, today, I ask you to pay my debt. Well, he already has. I ask you to absorb my debt. He will. I ask you to cover my sin with your blood. He will. And when he does, it's forever. It's forever. Forgiven. And to that, we all come together and we say, Amen. Anybody glad to be saved today? I sure am. Yes, yes. Let's stand to our feet and let's go to the Lord in prayer. This morning, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, this morning, if you have never trusted Jesus as your Savior, please admit you have a sin debt. Admit you cannot pay it. Admit that Jesus Christ is the only chance you have. You are 100% dependent on his sacrifice and trust him as your Savior today. He will absorb every bit of that debt. He will take it away from you, and he will give you in exchange his own righteousness. And in doing so, you are secure forever and ever in heaven and a relationship with him. And so today, trust him. It it may be that today that you say, well, you know, Pastor John, uh, I'm already saved. Well, let's just rejoice in a little bit today. And I'd like to do something today, if you're comfortable with this. Some of you men may not be comfortable, and that's fine. You know, that, that, that some, uh, there's still a, a COVID threat, I guess, out there. But today, this morning, I'm going to ask our fathers just to come and meet with me here. And I just want to pray over you, because I know how tough your job is. I know many of you have burdens. If you'll just come and you'll just meet with me right here. I, I'm, I just want to say this. I'm in the same boat as you. Even if you're a grandfather, whatever, whatever God has. And now, if you can't make it down here, don't worry about it. Just stay right there in your seat. But I want to join with you today because uh, I'm going to stand on the floor with you because I am with you. I'm one of you, and I understand the struggles and I understand you know, the burdens that you carry. And so I know some of you have got sons, grandsons, uh, you know, ch- uh, daughters. And I know that right now, that, that don't raise your hand, but some of you right now, you've got children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. You're praying for their salvation. And so let's join together uh, today, and let's just ask God to use us, you know. How many of you guys would admit this? You're not perfect. How many of you guys would admit you've made mistakes? Y'all, y'all's hand ain't going up very high at all. I mean, you should be, you should be, it should be right here. How, how many of you realize you've made mistakes? I say this to you. Number one, confess those mistakes before God. Ask your children to forgive you. Tell them you messed up, and tell them in God's grace you're going to move forward and do the right thing. And all of us are in that same boat. Is that true? So let's pray together. Lord, love these men. God, they, they, they have such strength. Some of them, they don't even realize how much they have. God, I know some of them are just struggling right now. Lord, as fathers, they're in situations. And Lord, they're waiting and waiting and waiting. And Lord, uh, help them to keep waiting. Help them to keep fertilizing. Help them to keep watering. God, this morning, use these men to lead our church. God, thank you for the leadership of our ladies. We have so many great women. Lord, but today is Father's Day. So, Lord, I just want to emphasize the men's leadership today, the role that you've given them in their homes, in their families, in their churches, in their culture. God, I pray that today that you would use them. Lord, use us to make that difference, to raise that child, to turn them to you, to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. God, for the man that's here right now that's struggling or feeling like that he's never going to amount to anything, God, remind him you created him. As long as he's breathing, there's hope. God, for that man today that's messed up and feels like that he can't overcome that, Lord, remind him of the cross. Remind him that you remove the guilt and the shame that if, if he confesses that to you, that, Lord, you're faithful and just to forgive him 
and to set him up anew. And so, God, thank you for him. God, I pray that we would pattern ourselves after our Father. Thank you for a worthy Redeemer, willing to come, willing to die, willing to sacrifice himself, that we might be saved and be able to lead in this capacity. And, Lord, we're very careful to thank you. We love you. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. As these men return to their seats, Brother Chuck, what are we singing? Jesus Messiah. Jesus Messiah. What a great song. Lift it up, church, if you would. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I'm right here. Please come see me. I want to introduce you to Jesus, our Messiah.
and amen. Rebecca, do you have any announcements you need to make? Yes, I do. All right, go ahead. Uh, next Sunday is another one of our kids, pre-KK kids churches that we are having available plus nursery. Nursery is open all Sundays now. Uh, we're working on getting our Wednesday nights back up, so if you have a baby and you want to bring them on Wednesday, let us know right now. We need that pre-registered ahead of time. Let me know about that. But yes, next week we have our three and five-year-olds. We have another uh, kids church for y'all. We're looking to open up our big kids church, our elementary kids church soon. If you'd like to be a part of that team, we need you. We need some men. We need some good uh, men to come on board, too. We've got a lot of wonderful ladies and a few good men. Sounds like a... Anyway, uh, yes, yeah, so, but we need some more men to step up. I saw a bunch, Pastor John, yeah. down here today that yeah. I'm like, ooh, our guys could use y'all as mentors in their life. So come on, join our team. I'll let you know what opportunities are there. I'll put you on a rotation so you won't be out at a lot of services. Also, the church app, if you've not downloaded that yet, especially if you have parents, that's how we do our check-in process. So please download that today. And if you've, your kids have not jumped into kids' ministry and you're waiting for us to open back up, please come see me. Let me get you in the database so we can be ready to roll when we do open back up. And if you're technologically challenged as I am, uh, we have people that can help you uh, to download that. Frank, come here, man. Come here, Frank. Uh, Frank has been, how long have you been coming here, Frank? Seven years. Be seven years in all. Be seven years. That's the number of God, so it's a good time to, uh, you have to visit here seven years. We have to watch you for, I don't know if I was watching him or he was watching me, but somebody was being watched. So anyway, you know, several years ago, every church has a cheerleader. And it's not that they're, we designate them as cheerleader, and it's not that, you know, they designate themselves. Mark Brown was our church cheerleader, and Mark passed away. And I thought, well, who's going to take Mark's place as our cheerleader? And lo and behold, Frank shows up. This is our church cheerleader. He don't wear a skirt, but he's our cheerleader. He don't, he don't throw anybody or hold anybody up. He holds up Jesus. Amen. But, amen. But uh, Frank comes today. He's obviously been saved, been scripturally baptized. He's been visiting here for seven years, so he knows the good, the bad, and the ugly, and he wants to join uh, today in our fellowship. Do I have a motion? Do I have a motion that Jeff McDonald have a second? RJ speaks. All in favor, by an upraised hand. Any opposed? You're going to vote for yourself? <laughs> All right. He started to vote, amen. All right, any opposed by the like sign? All right, we welcome Frank. I'm, Frank, I'm going to have you just to stand here if you can, and just to, uh, you can face, face me. And uh, I don't see Pastor Jared, so Pastor Jared must not have any announcements today, but uh, I want to thank Pastor Jared and those that went with him on the trip this week. Jared said it went really good, and so he'll be giving you an update soon. Thank you all for those of you who went, and uh, thank you all for going. I know you took a lot of time out of your schedule to go. And uh, I know it was a sacrifice. So thank you so much for going and for helping. And to our young people, thank you for going as well. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Uh, right after we are dismissed, or actually we're sent, uh, visitors, if you'll go back to our visitor table, we have a gift for you. Fathers, if you'll go back and get your pop. All right. How about that? Pops for pops. That, what, that's what we should have called it today. Pops for pops. So that's what we're calling it now. All right, right, John Hoots? That's pops right there. All right. Pops for pops. All right. Yes, sir. All right. But if you'll do this, if you can, hey, come, come and make Frank welcome. We love Frank. Y'all just come and welcome him into our fellowship today. All right. God bless you. You are sent. <laughs>